Happy Monday, everybody, and thank you for listening to episode 33 of the Southern Conservative Podcast. My name is Ty. Just some quick housekeeping notes before we begin today's podcast. We are quickly approaching Easter, and that means another visit with my family in Maryland. And I can't record podcasts when I'm on the road. So there will not be a podcast on Thursday this week. It depends on what's going on in the news, whether there will be a podcast on Friday. If you follow my Facebook page, facebook.com slash southernconservative, you know that I usually post updates if there is a change in the podcast schedule. Podcasts are normally Monday through Thursday. But this week, there will not be a podcast on Thursday, and I might do one on Friday to make up for it. So stay tuned for that. If you want to know when new podcasts are uploaded to this channel, the best thing to do is to subscribe to the channel. So I encourage you to do that. So no podcast this Thursday. It's possible there might be a podcast on Friday. And next week, there definitely will not be a podcast on Tuesday. I'll keep providing you with reminders from now until then. Okay, so I did a podcast last Friday when news came out that it was very likely Jeff Sessions was going to fire Andrew McCabe. And come Friday evening, when I was heading to the hospital to work, it was about 8.30 in the evening, and there still was not any breaking news of a firing. But then it came around 10 p.m. So if you didn't know it already, Jeff Sessions has fired Andrew McCabe. Now, there is an office inside the DOJ called the Office of Personal Responsibility. Isn't it amazing we actually have an office to manage personal responsibility? Anyway, this is the office that recommended to Jeff Sessions that he should fire Andrew McCabe. And the firing stems from what is believed to be pretty damning discoveries made by Inspector General Michael Horowitz. Horowitz, as originally reported, has been investigating how the FBI and DOJ handled the Hillary email investigation. And McCabe is heavily involved in that scandal, frankly. I'll detail that in just a moment. And the Inspector General is expected to release a report sometime this month or possibly in early April detailing what all the FBI and DOJ were doing during that investigation. And we know the bottom line is top officials let Hillary Clinton off the hook because they wanted to see her be president. But the inspector general isn't just investigating the email scandal. Recent reporting suggests he is also investigating leaks of classified information to the media. And that has been a huge problem ever since the election in 2016. I mean, we have almost daily leaks of the Trump-Russia collusion investigation. Just look at all of the stories that have been published by the New York Times and the Washington Post alone. The Inspector General is also investigating unmasking. This definitely involves top intelligence and national security folks in the Obama administration. One of the prominent names both unmasked and then leaked to the media was Michael Flynn. His name was picked up when intelligence agents were surveilling Russians that he was communicating with. Now, standard procedure is any time an American is picked up when conducting foreign surveillance, his or her name is kept confidential. You would identify the person simply as an American or American number one, something to that effect. You would never use the actual name of the individual. But if you need to use the name, The name is kept as confidential information. And when the name is revealed, that's called unmasking. So Michael Flynn's name was unmasked. And not only that, his name and the fact he was having conversations with foreign nationals from Russia was then leaked to the media. Somebody within the intelligence community unmasked his name and later leaked it to the media. And there were many, many other people whose identities were unmasked while Obama was president. On top of all of this, Jeff Sessions has asked the Inspector General to investigate the FBI and DOJ as it relates to the Trump-Russia collusion investigation. Now to that point, there are whispers out there that Sessions will indeed appoint a second special counsel to work alongside the Inspector General. But needless to say, 
Horowitz has been extremely busy, and from what has been said, the report that will be coming out soon will absolutely be explosive. Now getting back to McCabe. Supposedly McCabe lied to the Inspector General about leaks that were made to the Wall Street Journal. McCabe allegedly authorized leaks to the Wall Street Journal about a dispute between the FBI and DOJ about how to proceed with an investigation into the Clinton Foundation. We know that there is an active investigation into the foundation being conducted right now by the FBI field office in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was this behavior that the Office of Personal Responsibility recommended that McCabe be fired. But this isn't the only questionable behavior coming from McCabe. He was very heavily involved in the Clinton email investigation. So the first part of that investigation wrapped up on July 5th, 2016, when James Comey gave his exoneration statement. The investigation was later reopened in late October 2016, after emails were discovered on Anthony Weiner's laptop that contained email exchanges between his wife, Huma Abedin, and Hillary Clinton. But McCabe was aware of those emails one month prior to that. And while McCabe was heavily involved in this investigation, it wasn't until about a week before the 2016 election that he recused himself from the investigation. It was at that time that the media first reported that McCabe's wife had received over $700,000 from two PACs with ties to former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe while she was running for a state Senate seat in Virginia in 2015. She received over $700,000 from PACs associated with Terry McAuliffe the year before the Hillary investigation started. And Terry McAuliffe is a very close friend of Hillary Clinton. So you can see the conflict here. McCabe should never have been involved in that investigation in the first place. We learned that McCabe had been in communication with Lisa Page and Peter Strzok concerning some sort of insurance policy to help prevent Trump from being elected and then to take down his presidency should he be elected. And while we have seen some of those text messages from Strzok and Page, we haven't seen any text messages from Andrew McCabe. It's very possible that Michael Horowitz has viewed McCabe's text messages. We know he has seen the ones from Page and Strzok. And we know that Peter Strzok was involved in rewriting Comey's conclusion of the email investigation, a conclusion that was written months before the investigation was completed and key witnesses, including Hillary, were interviewed. That's why some have called this an exoneration before an investigation. The bottom line is McCabe is no saint. But what was his reaction to his firing? Well, he released several statements blaming President Donald Trump for his firing, stating the president has been trying to get him fired and has been trying to ruin his name and his career in which he spent over 20 years with the FBI. And now it's very likely he won't be getting his government pension, which he would have been eligible to receive starting yesterday. But Trump had nothing to do with McCabe's firing. It was the Office of Personal Responsibility within the Justice Department that made the recommendation for him to be fired. The president was not involved in any way. And besides, for the OPR to recommend the deputy FBI director to be fired, something very serious either had to have happened or had been discovered. McCabe has no one to blame but himself. As I mentioned earlier, I do have a Facebook page. Please go to facebook.com slash southernconservative. That's facebook.com slash southernconservative. There you will find links to conservative news articles on stories you may not hear about in the mainstream media. Plus, if you follow the news feed, you'll find links to the daily podcasts. Be sure to also subscribe to this YouTube channel. You will be notified each time a podcast has been posted. New podcasts are posted daily, Monday through Thursday. There was another breaking story on Friday concerning Peter Strzok and one of the judges in the Michael Flynn case. Now, it's important to provide some context to this story. Remember that the FBI had interviewed Flynn in January 2017 concerning conversations he had with Russian officials, including Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. This was part of the FBI's Trump-Russia collusion investigation. Peter Strzok was one of the guys who interviewed Flynn. 
and as reported a few weeks ago, Strzok believed that Flynn did not lie to the FBI, and James Comey felt the same way. Fast forward then to the special counsel who took over the FBI's investigation. Robert Mueller was able to get Michael Flynn to plead guilty to lying to the FBI on December 1, 2017. Basically, Mueller continued to investigate Flynn, and Flynn went broke in order to fund his legal defense. It's also said that Mueller had threatened to go after Flynn's son. In the end, Flynn had no choice but to end all of this, and he winds up pleading guilty before Judge Rudolph Contreras. Well, about a week after Flynn pleads guilty, Judge Contreras recused himself from the case. And people have been asking, why did this judge recuse himself just days after Flynn pled guilty? Well, a news story broke on Friday that may provide some insight to this. As it turns out, this judge is also a FISA court judge. Now, the first question that comes to mind is this. Did he sign off on any of the FISA applications to spy on Carter Page? Well, newly revealed text messages between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page show how Strzok wanted to meet with Judge Contreras after he found out that the judge had been appointed to the FISA court. Now, why would Strzok want to meet with this judge after learning that? Remember, Strzok was involved in opening the investigation into Donald Trump in Russia collusion. And we've already seen plenty of the text messages between Strzok and Page about their disdain for Donald Trump. As head of counterintelligence, was Strzok discussing FISA applications with this judge? There are some serious questions that need to be answered. But there is one very damning text message that Strzok wrote. Strzok and Page were discussing how Strzok would be able to meet with the judge without making the appearance of having a conflict of interest. And he writes to Lisa Page, He's super thoughtful, meaning the judge is super thoughtful, and rigorous about ethics and conflicts. Some name is redacted, suggested a social setting with others would probably be better than a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to invite you to that cocktail party. Of course you'll be there. Have to come up with some other work people cover for action. So basically, Strzok knows he can't meet one-on-one -on -one with the judge, and someone suggested to him, the name is redacted, that the two get together at a social setting. And he writes that if they are going to have a cocktail party, he would need to bring other people from work so it doesn't appear that he and the judge are there simply to discuss business under the radar. And this judge sits on the FISA court, and Strzok was working counterintelligence during the time the FBI took four FISA applications before that court to spy on Carter Page. Folks, not only did the FBI withhold key information from the court and provide the court with information from a dossier that was full of unverified information and lies, but it appears this FBI official was fixing the court. This judge seriously has a lot to answer for, especially if it turns out his name is on one of those warrants the FBI got to spy on Carter Page. So what does all of this have to do with Michael Flynn? Again, remember that Flynn was interviewed by Peter Strzok, and Strzok clearly wanted to meet with this judge. Now, I don't know if the two actually met, but I think it's safe to say that they did, and I'm sure the two clearly had some sort of relationship. Now, the timing is what is very interesting here. Flynn pled guilty before Judge Contreras on December 1st, 2017. The very next day, it was reported that the special counsel had removed Strzok from the case after anti-Trump text messages between him and Page were discovered. That's something else to keep in mind, folks. Not only did Strzok help start the FBI's investigation into Donald Trump, but he was later asked to join the special counsel team. Recall that in a text message he wrote to Lisa Page, he didn't know if he wanted to join the special counsel because he knew there was no there there. And he would know this because he had already worked on the FBI's investigation into Donald Trump, including interviewing Michael Flynn. But anyway, Flynn pleads guilty on December 1st, 2017, 
On December 2nd, it was reported that Strzok exchanged anti-Trump text messages with Lisa Page, and he gets booted from the special counsel team. Contreras recused himself on December 7th. The timing is way too convenient. Did Contreras know that some of the text messages that might be revealed show a relationship he had with Strzok? The corruption here is on a scale that is absolutely unbelievable. Not only is there zero evidence of collusion, but the special counsel has ruined Michael Flynn's life. And he did absolutely nothing wrong when he communicated with Sergei Kislyak. It would have been appropriate for him to be in communication with Russians, as well as foreign nationals from other countries during the transition period. Now, I'm no lawyer, but it seems to me there should be some legal recourse Flynn can take to reverse his plea and to declare that somehow the FBI and the special counsel had it in for Flynn. We'll have to see what happens in the Flynn case, but hopefully things will work out in his favor. Well, that's all for today, folks. I hope you'll join me tomorrow for another podcast. Have a great day.